Thanks for having me. Um, I'm Mike Redder. I'm the state coordinator for the Ohio Pollinator Habitat Initiative, as well as the coordinating wildlife biology, biologist for Pheasants Forever. Um, so I pretty much cover the entire state. So what I'm going to do today is just give some kind of overviews on some best management practices for establishing pollinator habitat, um, just because there are many different pollinator habitats out there, many different goals but the guidelines should still be fairly similar. Um, this is the basically the beginning part of it. Um, so we'll get into this and then of course I'll have plenty of time for questions. So we're going to cover site selection because um, again if we want to put in a pollinator habitat we've got to figure out where we want to do it, where the best place to do it is. Just because I have an area doesn't always mean it's the best option. So let's take some um, Let's take some uh, insight into this and then maybe that'll help you pick um, the best site available. So with, with that, um, this is the first step in your pollinator habitat, um, looking for that. So the site specific criteria is very simple. Um, most pollinator species need, you know, at least a minimum of six hours of sunlight. So we wanna make sure we got plenty of open sunlight. Um, is there existing vegetation, vegetative cover or not? Uh, what's the topography? Uh, because different slopes, whether it gets an uh, evening sun or a morning sun, or if it's north or south, can kind of change things or dictate potentially what species you're having or because of the conditions. Um, soil characteristics, uh, offsite or adjacent land cover. Uh, and then the other ones will be planning design, size, shape, and maintenance considerations. Because this will all go into how you're gonna prep it, what species you're gonna do it, and then how you're gonna maintain it long-term. So it's very important to make those thought process and considerations up front, because um, you don't wanna put something somewhere that's very very difficult to get to, because then you won't be able to perform the maintenance, the maintenance when you need to do it. Um, for example, you don't wanna put it in an area that may be locked by crops or by certain activities that you can't get to it uh, anytime that you need to. Sun exposure, why is it important? We talked about, uh, mentioned that the six hours of sunlight, um, it's going to keep those areas open, dry, warm. Um, pollinator habitat is very beneficial with bare ground uh, for a lot of our ground nesting bees. So that sunlight is also important uh, for them to keep their nest uh, warm and dry um, and to get the biggest bang for the buck. Uh, slope and aspect, mentioned a little bit about this, uh, north, facing slopes are always going to be cooler and wetter than south facing slopes. Same thing with west facing slopes are going to be, you know, typically warmer and drier than your east facing slopes just because of sunlight uh, and the topography that they're getting. Uh, we want to look and see what existing vegetation is out there because that is going to lend into what site preparation methods we look at. It doesn't always, it doesn't mean that one side is better than the other, but we just want to make sure that we look at those considerations. And what those are is, what is the growth habitat um, of the species present? Is it a cool season? Is it a warm season? Um, because we need to know what those, what those plans are out there so that if we're going to remove them or we're going to manipulate them in some way, um, we need to know the best time to do that. Um, are they herbaceous or are they woody? Is this an annual, a biannual, or perennial plant? Because that's all important based off of our method of, that's going to be the next half of this discussion would be the site preparation. Annuals, you'll do treat them one way. The same thing with biennials or, or potentially even the long-lived perennial um, plants that we do not want in this. Or at the same time is, if this is more of a restoration where you have some beneficial plants, we want to know what's there so that we know what's the best methods that we can remove the unwanted stuff without harming uh, the good stuff. And when I talk about cool season and warm season, that's just centrally the growth pattern. Um, a lot of our natives are, are, I would consider more on the warm season, especially our middle and late season growing. Um, natives. A lot of our native warm season grasses um, are in this category. They typically peak in that June, July, August, September range, whereas cool seasons like lawn or turf grass, you get that early growth early in the year. 
in the summertime like now that's why our lawns are green are brown from the from the drought and this time of year they don't do very well but then they'll pick back up here um, in August and September and even later in the year. So that'll all determine on that existing vegetation what we do. So those evaluations that are out there, you're gonna need to evaluate it. So you can also look for all those undesirable noxious weeds. Oops, sorry. Undesirable noxious weeds, um, because depending on what species are there, uh, we may need to look at uh, multiple years worth of, of removal of that plant before we actually do our planting so that we don't have uh, any of the issues from those invasive plants. Adjacent land use. What the neighbor has is very important, especially if they're on your south and west side of your property or your area that you want to or build your pollinator site because our most dominant wind is out of the southwest and why a lot of our natives or a lot of plants around can spread through rhizomes or through the soil majority of our problems are windborne so if you plant adjacent to something and they have issues on that side of the fence over time you're going to have those same issues so sometimes we are addressing adjacent land issues even before we start our pollinator habitat or we move our pollinator habitat to an area that will not be affected as heavily by what is adjacent um, to our property because again over time in succession whatever's next to your poly pollinator habitat site that's what's going to want to move in um, so at least you get a better understanding of what your potential risks are what your potential invasives are, um, whether they're noxious or not, um, because succession is typically um, the biggest thing that we fight. The design, size, and shape. Um, these are very important, again, because we have to look at what's, what are we going to be doing? How are we going to manage it? Um, do we, is it going to be round? Is it going to be square? Is it going to be oblonged? Um, how big is it going to be? Uh, the size can, can affect whether we're going to be able to do stuff by hand or need equipment. Um, and then remember, you know, certain, the more, the more turns you have or the more edge you create, that's the air, you're going to have more areas of constant um, invasion, especially if this is up against turf grass or a different edge so you know big ovals or more sweeping squares or rectangles um, but if you have lots of, of bendy areas and, and contour type stuff uh, you're going to be fighting a lot of edge potential um, invasion so we just want to make sure that we're, we're thinking about that it doesn't mean that it can't be done but again these are all little things to think about because I don't know how many times I've heard people say if I had to do it again, I would do this. And that's what we're just trying to, to get in that uh, thought process so that people understand. You definitely wanna, 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 wanna think about it. Doesn't mean that it can't be done. Uh, just means that you may have some more intense management than you know, if you chose a different, a different shape or a different location, but um, it doesn't deter you one way or the other. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the site prep. Um, and I'm just going to stress that 99% of all failures, whether it's pollinator habitat or prairie restorations, fail because of the lack or inadequate um, amount of site preparation. Um, I don't care what you want to plant out there. If your site preparation is done incor incorrectly or inadequately, um, it doesn't matter what you put out there. You're not going to get the desired effect or you're going to have a lot of increased ma maintenance, management, you're always going to be fighting it. And, you know, in my field where I work with, you know, large corporations, statewide agencies, um, golf courses, businesses, things like that, we look at pollinator habitat because by planting natives uh, and doing these long-term restorations, it can be a cost savings for them because of the management. It's not mowing it seven or 10 times a year. We're a, a typically addressing these once a year, once every other, or even once every third year, depending on where it's at and what those pressures are. Um, so if we don't do this site prep method and we don't do it correctly, 
and they're in there multiple times year after year after year, um, the benefits to them on the financial side go away. Uh, even though those environmental ones are there, um, they may not be as realized if we have lots of invasives. So really pay attention to your site prep. Um, it, it's worth spending the extra time, the extra to make sure that you're starting with something correctly uh, so that you can get something um, exceptional at the end. So the three P's we talk about with pollinator habitat establishment is planning, plan ahead. That's what we're doing. We're, we're looking at those site conditions, those areas. We're trying to figure out what size or shape I'm going to use and, and make sure I've got it in the best location that I've got out there. I'm gonna look at, you know, figure all this out to develop a, a management plan or a site prep plan, my species, and then my management. So I wanna have that all thought out of what's available to me as far as equipment or time or labor, because that may depict or dictate what size I do, you know, if I only got enough time and effort and can only handle a, an eighth of an acre or a quarter of an acre or a small pollinator garden site, um, I don't want to go out and put five acres of habitat in and, and not be able to manage it um, and then always be fighting something or, or not happy. Patience. The native plants are not, uh, you know, even though we'll design mixes and, and we'll create annuals and we'll do things to try to make them as showy as we can, um, you know, in those first couple years, these things take time. Um, our native plants and our pollinator, most of our wildflowers that we use have anywhere from five to 20 foot root systems. So they're gonna build, they're gonna be doing a lot of building under the ground and out of sight uh, in those first couple years. Uh, you have plants, depending on what you choose in your mix that you may not see uh, in, a, in a planting until the fourth, fifth, or even later. Uh, years uh, in a planting just because of, of how it's set up and, and how those plants react and, and they do it. So a lot of times we'll we'll put species in mixes because we want them to cycle through. They're, they're placeholders, if you will. Uh, we know they're only going to last a year or two, but we want those there while the other ones are setting their feet in and getting ready to grow. So be patient. Um, you know, there's that that adverb or there's that saying for perennials, you know, the first year they sleep the second year uh, they creep and then the third year they leap because that's basically that that process of them setting their feet and their root systems before they really become robust and, and really start to start to take over. And then persistence, um, you, you know, while while native habitats are being planted because of a lot of benefits. I mean, there's there's several from uh, several environmental benefits with financial benefits, aesthetic benefits. Um, you know, you do need to be persistent with them because again, any, any habitat that's set there to be designed, there's going to be, you're constantly staving off uh, natural succession. And that succession can be from the grasses if you decide to use them in the mix, wanting to become thicker and thicker. Um, for those of you that have planted or, or dealt with, uh, you know, purple coneflower, you put it in a small bed, it becomes very aggressive. And a lot of times it, it just, it moves everywhere. Uh, so even keeping keeping the good stuff, you know, in check, that's persistence. Uh, weed control um, is being persistent, um, but you just depending on the site, you know, you just need to stay on top of things because there's lots of things we can do, but if things get too far along, sometimes it takes a, a, a big project to get things back in check, and, and that's, not, that's not the goal um, of, of doing pollinator habitat. So again, um, it depends on what's out there on the site. Um, sites with, with minimal weed pressure following like a soybean crop, a, a bare field, things like that is gonna take very, very little site prep. Uh, you know, just maybe one application of, of a herbicide. Maybe it doesn't even need that. Um, whereas there's other heavily vegetated sites, say ones that have been lawn or turf grass or even have, uh, you know, honeysuckle or autumn olive shrubs on them. Um, it's going to take some time um, to work to work on those to get them to bear before we would uh, even decide to plant the the first pollinator um, flower seed. Things to remember: um, no two pollinator sites are exactly the same. Meaning, once you get into this process, 
we, we base our decisions off of what happens and we have lots of experience and can guidance, but you really do never know how it's going to react and what's there. Um, I, I will say is I've never found a, a site or a situation that we couldn't fix or couldn't deal with, but there have been many ones. While I'll give you a template and an outline and we have some job sheets and we have some of that guidance and I've got the website at the end of this that you can use as your outline and your template because the process, the process is the same. It's, it's how your site reacts to that process uh, that can be slightly different um, from, from site to site. They can range in size from a few square feet or a few hundred square feet to several hundred acres. Um, and we've done them all. And that, and depending on that size, is, is going to dictate which, which method you decide to do. Um, and then understandably, if you have a small pollinator garden of a, you know, a few square feet or a few hundred square feet, more than likely is going to get a lot more care because it's going to be probably in front of a house or a business, a school, a church, anything like that, where it's going to have lots of eyes on it. And people are going to, going, to, going to occupy it. Whereas if you have a large field, you know, yes, you'll be able to see it, but you're not covering every single, you know, square foot of it, you know, all the time. So uh, keeping, that at, keeping that in mind uh, through your planning of what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. So we're going to talk about small sites. So if we have areas that are, you know, less than an acre, um, sol solarization is a, is a very practical way. It works very well um, to get some of this done. It just is not practical on very, very large sites. Um, small strips um, in your yard, along a fence, in front of a business, thing like that, that, you know, that, that potentially could either be a pollinator garden or a pollinator habitat. And we'll talk more about the differences later, um, I'm sure, through questions. But um, those are different things to consider and um, solarization works, works really nice. Um, here, here's a picture of, of doing some solarization. So remember is the process of this is you depend the area that you want to do. You mow it very short, get rid of anything spiky that could poke a hole in your plastic uh, or any noxious invasive seasons that may be out there to get ready to go. You want to water everything because remember, we're basically going to make this like a little mini greenhouse. Um, so we want to be able to address, address what's out there. Um, we're, we're trying to stimulate that seed bank because we want to get everything that's potentially going to be a problem later on, all that seed to germinate and grow and die off so that when we decide when we're done with this and we put in the perennial plants that we want to keep, we're not constantly fighting that seed bank, at least the seed bank that's that's there. It doesn't mean stuff won't blow in. So you're looking at covering this with 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 some heavy millimeter uh, plastic, uh, two four. I've seen even six or eight. Um, but the key thing is solarization is clear plastic, not black plastic. That is a completely different method. That is essentially shading everything out. Um, that's a different method and a different process. It has, to me, in my opinion, has a lot of problems. Uh, so if we're talking about best management practices, the clear plastic for the reasons that I mentioned about, we're trying to stimulate the growth of every seed that we possibly can that's in that seed bank so that we get it removed. So we're really trying to almost essentially start with a sterile area um, that we're gonna put our seeds in that we want and that's all that's gonna be there. That's the thought process. And you wanna make sure that you tie down all the edges. You don't want the wind to catch it and to blow it. Um, otherwise you'll have some major issues. Um, it says wait six to eight weeks checking intermittently, intermittently. Essentially is you'll be able to watch this. Everything will turn green, it'll turn white, and then it'll start to turn brown. Um, and essentially, as soon as that happens, you're going to go through and remove all of that vegetation, like with a rake, um, and pull it off. And to me, this is like the, the directions on a shampoo bottle, rinse or, uh, you know, rinse, walk, and rinse and repeat. Essentially, you want to try to do this two or three times throughout the growing season. So if you start this in late May to early June when temperatures get up, um, about every 30 to 45 days, you're essentially redoing this process. So you, once you rake everything off, you rewater it, you put it down, because um, 
we'll talk about this later, our, our, our ideal time to plant our natives is during the dormant season. So you're essentially you got all summer into early fall to do this. Um, the more vigilant you're, you're on this, the better the results, the more sterile of an environment you're gonna go into and a better result that you're gonna have. So maybe you don't do solarization, you just got an area, you can treat this almost like a garden. So you can hand pull, you can use tillers, hose, stuff like that to remove the vegetation to get out there. Um, if it's small enough, I mean, we, we, we've seen little pollinator way stations being done at the edges or along walkways and things like that. Uh, it's, it's definitely practical um, in that size and those methods. So essentially it's the same process you're doing with a garden. You're typically trying to remove, you know, anything that you have out there that's not wanted or undesirable. Um, you just want to make sure you get all the roots and just not point at the top because out of sight, out of mind does not work for invasive species. They quickly become back into sight. Um, and so once you remove all those, get everything ready to go, um, we're, we're basically at that same process. It, it, it's usually going to take you a few times during the summer uh, and, and when things are growing. And remember that that growing chart of cool season and warm season, we have both cool season and warm season annuals uh, in Ohio. So just because you do something early in the season, you're going to have to do it multiple times because things will keep trying to come back. Larger sites. These are our bigger sites. We're, we're probably talking these are going to be more like pollinator habitat or prairies or, or meadows. Um, these are, you know, these are our large sites that we're typically going to use equipment, uh, potentially contractors or, or neighbors or farmers, or if you have the means yourself, um, that's great. But typically these are those, those bigger areas. Um, I'm just going to come out and say it. Tillage does not work. Tilling an area does not work whatsoever. Um, it essentially just replants everything over and over and over again. Um, if you want an organic method for large acreages, we look at mow board plowing, essentially because you're cutting down into the soil four to six inches deep and you're essentially just flipping that sod, flipping that sod upside down. So you're burying the root mass, you're burying the sod, and you're also burying the seed bank. And you're left with the bottom edge of um, that topsoil. Um, and typically you're not dealing with much. We do that in the summer, let it dry out, lightly disc it in the fall just to make it a nice prepared seed bed. And then we're ready to go with our dormant season. So um, there is an organic, organic option for large acreage, but tillage, meaning tilling or disking, is not it. So. Um, Sites with uh, woody vegetation, um, understanding um, I am, we use herbicides all the time um, and we can have this discussion here in a few minutes. I'll, I'll go into some reasons why, but um, herbicides done with the, at the right rates with the right herbicides and the right methods are very practical, especially on large sites. Um, and you can do it with minimal, minimal impact um, to any of the species that you're not wanting to target. And that's both insects and vegetation. Um, so it's just that th there's lots of things that need to be considered and people need to know what they're doing, but you can safely do it if it is desired. So for best results, we're looking at multiple seasons. Again, if we go back and remember our charts uh, that showed the cool season, the warm season, the cool season, spring and fall, we have cool season um, that are out there. Um, I'm going to show you a uh, uh, an animation later on that, that'll enhance this understanding of why we do multiple seasons. Um, but essentially spring and summer, we only get suppression. We don't remove anything permanently because of their growth patterns. Uh, fall is when we get our control. So we want to do uh, at least three seasons of, of control if you're going to choose to do the um, herbicide methods. Monitoring is definitely important on large sites, especially in the, the establishment process and the site prep because we need to make sure that we're going to take the time and effort to do a herbicide or to plow or to do solarization. And we wanna make sure we're getting the desired effect or, or are there things coming in there that we need to address? Uh, do we need to switch up if you're using herbicides? Do we need to switch the chemicals that we're using? Do we need to do something at a different time? Um, or if we're using a mechanical or a hand or solarization is, is, is it working as, as we're wanting it to? 
So here's the timing. Typically we're looking at fall and spring or spring and fall. Um, this is the double her herbicide method. Typically we're using three, uh, fall, spring, fall, when it talks to do like the roadside herbicide, the roadside applications that I work with ODOT on. Uh, and then even a lot of our farm bill programs that we're working with, uh, anything that's non-CRP, CRP has a, a shorter window. We don't usually typically get that third season in there, uh, but Equip and, and some of the other ones we do. So, so here's, a, here's an illustration of thistle. Um, understanding that thistle is one of our most um, and very hardy um, invasive species that we have. This is Canada thistle. Um, so as you can see, we've got a, a flower that's in the flowering method here. And i um, get my little cursor. It's already flowering. And you can see that you know, if I would just come through and do a herbicide, I may not even reach the small rosette on the ground. And as you can see, we've got these tillers and other things all through here that have not yet been exposed to the surface um, to even receive that application. And if we do this when these plants are growing, we're not getting into that root mass. So that's why if we have an area that has lots of noxious or invasive weeds, we're probably looking at one to two years, maybe even three years, especially if we're talking woodies, uh, autumn olive and, and bush honeysuckle, because of the sheer amount of weeds or of, uh, of berries and seeds that they put on the ground, you're looking at three years of control of, of that plant, of herbicides or other methods to control it before we ever do any kind of plantings. So regardless of if you're in site prep and you're gonna do it, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna decide to do herbicide, there's many different methods you can use. There's many different applications and, and some are more uh, strategic, some are more selective, others are more or broad or broad broadcasting. Um, but the the timing is probably the most important thing that we have to understand if we decide to use or use herbicides. So um, if you remember nothing from this, this presentation, um, this slide right here is probably the one that I would I pay attention to the most because I didn't, I, I, we're basically talking about plant phenology and, and, and what works the best while we're out there. So if you're sitting there when plants are in dormant or in dormancy, regardless of the method you use to try to remove them, you don't affect them either way. They're dormant. Everything is store, stored down here in their, um, down in their roots. If we're talking about leaf out, which is typically spring and summer for most of our plants, especially a lot of our invasives, if you look at this, the plant, and this can be trees too, is everything's going up. It's, it's, it's growing leaves. Um, it's trying to grow. So no matter what you do to the plant above the ground, everything's going north, not south. So without doing something that could ex ex exhaust that supply of stuff going up, um, that's the only way that you can control that, that species. Uh, I.e. tall goldenrod um, is one that we have some, some limited success is if we mow it uh, multiple times and then mul multiple years, uh, you can reduce the number of the numbers in your planting of, of, of goldenrod, uh, just because of that, you're exhausting what's in that root system. But typically it's, it doesn't work that way. Flowering and fruiting. So remember plants are, you know, in the game to reproduce, to produce seed, to put on the gown so that there's more of those to go on. So until they produce fruit and go through their, finish out their reproductive cycle, they're typically moving things from the ground up. Um, and so a lot of that is you may suppress the plants, but typically you don't get control of the plants. So again, spring and summer. So when things begin to go in senescence, after flowering reproduction, typically in Ohio, this is late September to October, even early November, this is when the plant starts taking that food that it has or, or making the food through photosynthesis and sending it down into the root systems for the dormant period. This is when we have the greatest effect on plants as far as controlling them and removing them. Um, this is the best time to mow woodies uh, because you're, you're right after they reproduce, you're going to mow them off before they are able to re, restore their root systems for winter. 
So if this happens a couple times, you can, you can also reduce woody stems. So mowing it in the spring takes a tree into a shrub. Mowing it in the fall, you actually do get some kind of long-lived control. Uh, typically, you can stress the plant, um, stress the tree, but most of our plants, when we're talking herbicides, 90%, there's definitely some that we have to dress at other times, but most late fall applications are the safest uh, because when this senescence happens for our natives, it's much earlier than when it happens for our invasives. So our, our native plants, typically August, September are shutting down. Um, and then our, most of our invasives are actively growing into October and November. Um, so we can actually apply herbicides uh, during this time period for invasive species and a lot of cool season species and not even touch or hurt our natives whatsoever. So if you do decide to use a herbicide, choosing the appropriate application method is, is very important. There's lots of different ones out there and it's all gonna depend on the size of the project that you're on and what your desired formulation or objective is based off of am I going after tall woodies or short turf grass? So I just threw this in here that there are various types of those methods. Here's just an idea is it doesn't really matter. Um, they're all over the place on what you use. Most important thing is to make sure we're calibrating. It doesn't do us any good to go out there and dump a bunch of chemicals um, that aren't getting to where we need them to go. Um, or we wanna make sure that if we're going to do this herbicide, we only have to do it the minimal amount of times that we have to. So we wanna use the maximum rate um, at the right time. And then we're not out there doing this multiple, multiple, multiple times throughout a year. Um, limiting our potential impacts um, both environmentally um, and then also on on the vegetation and or the the insects that are out there. Uh, Non-selective application methods. This is your glyphosate. Um, this is your broad spectrum. It just kills everything. Uh, more your bare ground type applications. This is only used if you're trying to wipe out every single thing. Uh, potentially, this would be lawn conversions or field conversions. If there's a lot of, a lot of growth, but we want to remove everything, that'd be a more non-select herbicide. Select applications are more the targeted approach. Maybe we just want to go after some broad leaves. Maybe we just want to address some woodies. Maybe we just have cool season grasses. So we can do those in a more selective manner. Um, usually in the selective application, the herbicides are more expensive, but you use less. So in a lot of times it's about the same cost or even cheaper to use a selective herbicide, especially if you're gonna use a, a backpack sprayer and just do spot spraying, um, things like that. Because again, we wanna make sure we're using, if we're going to do this method, we wanna make sure that, it's, that it works. Uh, avoiding drift is important. We wanna make sure that we're only affecting the areas that we've designated need affected based off of what we're doing. So avoiding drift is important thing. We need to consider that. Um, professionals to do this or taking into account um, weather conditions um, because the higher the temperature um, and the lower the humidity a lot of times you can get things more vol volatility meaning they'll move more on you um, because of that heat so there's definitely some times that when you can look at this to be the most effective um, and we want to limit the exposure to the pollinators again these are the insects that are out there so there's definitely periods of low temperatures, different times of the day, we can address these, that we can have the least effect at all from anything passing by. We're not spraying things in flower. Uh, we're staying away from water courses. Um, we're not doing these things in the middle, the heat of the day when most everything is active. Um, and then, you know, then a lot of other reasons why, you know, we're out there, you know, trying to do these. So you, there is a safe way to do it if that is the method that is needed for that site based off of size or species or what's out there. So um, with that, I'm going to go to my last slide, which is just my information. Um, that's my phone number. Um, I pretty much always answer my phone. If not, I'll give you a shout back. Uh, these are two emails that you can reach me at. Uh, one is my Pheasants Forever email that I have uh, for work. And then we also have OPHI email. Uh, they both come to me. Um, and then we have information and fact sheets. Um, we just relaunched a new OPHI website this spring. Um, it's OPHI.info. Um, the site prep methods or best management practices on there, it's actually a sheet. I've got sample mixes. And then we also have lots of links to other resources like Xerces Society, Monarch Joint Venture, um, just to name a few. And we're always adding more as we see them. Um, so with that, I guess I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm about 40 minutes in and let's, um, 
I'm here for the assault of questions. <laughs> Thanks so much. That was great, Mike. Uh, if there are any questions, um, down at the bottom of your screen, there is an option for Q&A chat bubble, and then there's also another option for chat bubble. Either of those work fine. If you do have any questions for Mike, please just drop them in the, uh, in the chats below. So we'll give a few minutes, we'll let people type in their questions and looks like we have one from Reese. How are seed mitzes created to match the site? Um, so to match the site would just be, you know, whether it's a wet site or a dry site. Um, do we want um, particular heights? So do this working with solar companies. Uh, we, we make mixes that are two to three foot, typically plants that only happen that grow around those heights. Wet year and dry year, they'll fluctuate. But basically we, we build the mixes based off of the needs or the desires of how the site's gonna be utilized, what the landowner or individual wants it to look like. And then also, are there any particular benefits in certain areas? Are there any host species we need to consider like up north? You know, do we put in lupin for the kernel blue butterfly? You know, we're, we're adding common, uh, we pretty much have common swamp milkweed in all of our mixes because they, you know, common and swamp can occupy a lot of times. And then even though it says swamp, uh, you know, just wet spots in the field, sometimes we'll have swamp milkweed. Um, so really just, it's just based off of the soil conditions of the site, um, dry or wet, and then really the desired look or the outcome or what the targeted species or approach is. Um, we do, you know, you can do custom bee mixes that have a lot of clovers or legumes in them because some of those early things are really needed. These hives go on or we'll add a lot of species um, and, and, and folks that are, have hives like a wing stem and a lot of asters so that we can make a happy bees to kind of get them, you know, to nice, nice rated weight, weight, weight to get them through winter. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things that go into those, those mixes and um, on, on how they're doing. Um, there's, we, we have basic mixes that pretty much cover all the bloom periods that can be done anywhere in the state. And I, and I think out there is um, my philosophy designing seed mixes and what we have available through Ohio, through Pheasants Forever, and then I do mixes for the Farm Bill programs and a lot of the state agency is, it's like a pizza. The cheese pizza is our standard pollinator mix. It's really good by itself. It covers all the basics. It has everything that's needed out there, but depending on the locality and if you have something that you want to look at is, then we start adding the toppings, you know, whether it's pepperoni pizza, supreme, meat lovers, uh, we can really add in those other species and combinations to get those desired effects. Awesome. All right, do, let's see, we have a few more questions. Someone said, what services do you provide to landowners? Um, so me personally, the OPHI, we, we have like technical assistance. So um, we can talk to landowners. Um, it depends on the size of the site and where we're at. Um, I've got 83 partners around the state. Um, Pheasants Forever has 12 farm bill biologists and other coordinating biologists in the state. Uh, Division of Wildlife has, I think, six private lands biologists now. And then we also have Wildlife Service has three partners biologists, as well as Soil and Water Conservation District. Some of them have wildlife specialists. So we have a lot of people around the state that we can help match up or, or get a landowner to someone because there are a lot of programs out there like farm bill programs or potentially other ones or, or different counties have different programs that we can match them up to, to to get what they're done. So if you have questions what to do and how to do it, it depends on where you're located, whether I can do it, but either way, um, we definitely get you in contact with someone that can, you know, look at the property and give you suggestions because, you know, the, the motto for OPHI is, you know, all you can where you can. So, I mean, every little bit helps and we want to help you get that, uh, get the desired effect that you want and then those pollinator benefits. Great, uh, there's another question. What type of grasses do you normally recommend for pollinator plantings? Yeah, so um, native grasses are, are used in a couple different ways in pollinator planting. So typically we use native grasses for structure and because they have hollow stems that you'll get a lot of you know, larvae or eggs where those insects will lay them and that's how they spend the winter into the next spring. Um, but there are also some native species 
like um, prairie drop seed, for example, that is a beneficial pollinator grass itself. Um, typically the grasses that we would use are like little blue stem. Uh, I'll use side oats, prairie drop seed. Um, really any of the drop seeds are good. Um, I use witchgrass because we only use Blackwell in Ohio, which is a short growing. It's not the real tall, nasty stuff. Um, and then depending on the site, sometimes we will use cool season grasses like Timothy and Orchard. Um, we'll also use Purple Top, uh, Wild Rye, with the cool season native. It just really depends on the site condition, um, where it's located and what the desired effects are. But really, I would be easier to tell you, you just don't want to use Indian grass or big blue stem because they are in Ohio, one of our natives that can become very aggressive and take over a stand very, very quickly. Interesting. And it looks like there's one more. What programs are there for Ashtubula County? Yeah, so it depends on the size of it and kind of what you're doing, but um, every county in the state equip wildlife. It's a farm bill program that's available through US, uh, the US Department of Agriculture. Um, it's administered by the, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. So where your service center is um, in each, each county, um, depending on the acreage and, and there's, there's some other, thing, other hoops you have to jump through, that's one that's available throughout. Um, I don't know if the local soil and water district has any cost share, some different ones do, but most of it would be Nash Tabula would, uh, we definitely have, you know, we have technical assistance that we can give everywhere. Um, um, and we have roadside, we have got roadside projects up in Ashtabula County there um, that, um, that we've done. So, but yeah, mostly technical assistance, but there are farm bill programs in all 88 counties, um, just depending on, on size. Yeah, if anyone else has any questions on, you know, the EQIP program or, or how to get involved on in that, you can contact my office, you can contact the Farm Service Agency as well, and we would uh, definitely get you in the right direction and see if, if that's a good fit for you. Um, doesn't look like there's any other questions in the chat box. We'll give it one more minute to make sure everybody, uh, maybe someone's trying to type something out right now, but uh, if not, looks like uh, there's no more questions, but I'd like to thank you again, Mike, for uh, that great presentation. And I want to remind everybody that you should be being redirected to a site um, with a uh, survey for today's presentation and we would appreciate the feedback, uh, how we can improve what topics you want to hear about next time. A um, couple, couple more questions. It should only take a minute or two of your time, but we appreciate everybody for joining us tonight and uh, we'll see you next week for the last presentation. It's going to be a good one. Uh, so make sure you tune in next week. Thanks again, Mike. Thank you.